There's almost nothing worth saying about Street Fighter The Legend of Chun-Li. It barely even manages to register as so bad it's fun because so much of it is just boring. So why bother talking about it? Well, because it's a massive failure of intent. This feels like an honest attempt at taking the video game adaptation and elevating it to the same level of respect as literary adaptations. But they failed. Okay, how do I justify saying that they were trying to make an arty drama and not just some action schlock? Editing and camera work. These days, most garbage films that are cranked out with a little regard to actual quality are shot in 16 by 9 aspect ratio, because that's the same aspect ratio as an HDTV, and the stupid people who buy garbage movies out of the bargain bin at Walmart are more interested in using every square centimeter of their 50 inch television than they are in seeing interesting cinematography. These people aren't that bright, and they get distracted by the black bars at the top and bottom of the screen that frame a film that was originally shot in an aspect ratio wider than their TV screen. Also, it makes workflow easier. If you know that your movie is doomed to live out its life as a permanent member of the discount bin and late night cable TV, then you save yourself the trouble and shoot for home video. It saves everyone time and money. So HDTVs are 16.9. This ratio is also written out as 1.778 to 1. The Legend of Chun-Li is shot in the much, much wider 2.389 to 1 ratio. This isn't necessarily a judgment. Aspect ratio is just a tool and isn't inherently good or bad, but it means that someone in the film was spending a lot more time thinking about their job than anyone else was. It also speaks to tone. Action movies tend to use narrower aspect ratios because it allows for more vertical space and screen area for things like jump kicks and explosions. Characters on screen are closer together, but you can put some distance between them without cutting off the top and bottom of the face, making the characters more human and likable. Wider aspect ratios are usually used when the cinematographer wants to fit in lots of beautiful scenery, or because they want to put lots of distance between characters and isolate them. A close-up in a really wide aspect will cut off almost all of the character's face, making them less human and more mysterious. This probably seems like a really irrelevant point to be making, but it's significant because choices like aspect ratio are used to code the mental state that the audience should be in. Super wide aspect ratios are associated with arty camera work. On some level, this project started off as Crouching Tiger. They wanted Chun-Li to be a martial arts action movie that was, at its core, a character-driven drama, much like Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. It's not a bad goal, all told, and a character like Chun-Li isn't a bad choice if that's the story you want to tell. Within the Street Fighter universe, Chun-Li is easily one of the more accessible characters. She's an attractive martial artist who works for Interpol, she's out to avenge her father's death, and that's about it. Unlike a lot of other characters from the games, you don't have to exposit a deep mythology, explain magic powers, or introduce dozens of other core characters in order to tell her basic story. It's a straightforward origins and revenge plot that audiences are familiar with, which frees you up to really focus on character and story. The second cue is the editing. The movie starts with a glory shot of the Golden Gate Bridge, which pans over to Kid Chun-Li playing piano and her father watching proudly while adult Chun-Li narrates over top, ruminating on her childhood dream of being a concert pianist. This bit lasts almost a minute and has only two edits for a very quick insert. This cuts into a much faster paced sequence of aerial shots of Hong Kong, and the music changes from relaxed piano to tense electro rock. The editor and cinematographer are working to bring us into Chun-Li's emotional space. They want us to share her viewpoint and understand the contrast in her life, the peace and serenity of her early years in San Francisco versus the uncertainty and chaos of Hong Kong. This is acceptable filmmaking, but it still sucks because the script is fecking terrible. That's what went wrong with Crouching Tiger Hidden Street Fighter. The script sucks balls and Kristen Kruk can't narrate her way out of a paper bag. Of course, it's hard to stay interested in your voiceover script when it consists of gems like this. My father was an important businessman. She sounds like she's reading a bedtime story to a three-year-old. It's not the least of the script's problems, though. For some brevity, let's just make it into a list of major flaws, though I'm not going to be able to get to all of these in detail. 1. Terrible dialogue. 2. Villains with unclear goals and motivations. 3. Poorly explained stakes. 4. Multiple extraneous characters with dead-end plot lines. 5. Main character learns nothing worthwhile and does not change. 6. Changes are made to the source material that actively make the story worse. 
7. Inconsistent moral core in a movie about doing the right thing. And this is the bottom line. This movie sucks because the script is terrible. With all that in mind, here's a spoilerific plot rundown. Chun Li wants to be a concert pianist. Her family moves to Hong Kong. She is taught wushu by her father. Her father is kidnapped by Neil McDonough, who's playing Bison, but he looks and acts nothing like Bison, and that name sounds stupid anyway, so we're going to call him Neil McDonough. She becomes a concert pianist. She gets an ancient scroll as a gift. She sees a man with a gang tat get mugged in the subway. Her mom dies of cancer. Neil McDonough has his business partners killed for no discernible reason. Neil McDonough acts menacing. Chun Li disrespects her mother by giving her a Buddhist funeral dressed in black. She gets her scroll red or something, and I guess becomes homeless in Thailand because the guy with the gang tat who was also sweeping the street is apparently Yoda. This isn't well explained at all, and none of her friends or family seem concerned that she's quitting her job and moving to Bangkok on a whim shortly following the death of her mother without making any prior arrangements for housing, finances, or contact. Meh. We'll come back to this plot point later. Neil McDonough acts menacing while talking about real estate. Chun-Li fights off six guys while starving and sleep-deprived, then collapses after murdering a man. Seriously, he can barely get up, and she goes out of her way to tip a shelving unit full of tools onto the guy. Even if he's not dead, he's never gonna walk straight again. She's picked up by the guy with the gang tat, who trains her to make fireballs in an extended training montage. There's a good 20 minutes here following a real estate conspiracy subplot that ends with a chick fight in a bathroom at a nightclub, then never comes up again. But she learns something about the White Rose and a shipping manifest. Chun-Li shoots a man in the chest at point-blank range. Neil McDonough acts menacing while punching a dead body. Gen tells Chun-Li that Neil McDonough used to just steal fish but got rich, then he went all Dexter in the head and killed his wife in order to put all his goodness into his baby so that he wouldn't have a conscience and would only be pure evil. We'll come back to this one, too. The evil guys attack the secret hideout in the stupidest way possible by sending in ninjas to fight hand-to-hand -hand when they have a rocket launcher in the car. Both parts of that sentence are stupid, but it does give us the best line in the film. Give me that. Lock, you that give me that. I'll do it myself. In the explosion, Gen dies, but not really. Neil McDonough acts menacing. Vega attacks Chun-Li and gets his ass kicked. Chun-Li physically assaults a civilian for not giving up private shipping manifests. She gets trapped and captured. Neil McDonough kills her dad in front of her. She escapes, but takes a grazing shot in the market. The crowd starts throwing fruit, and goons decide that it's not worth taking another shot at the prone girl 20 feet away. Gen uses magic powers to heal her bullet wound in seconds, and she figures out how to make a fireball. She threatens to assault the dock worker again. There's a big fight at the docks. Again, fights the black dude. They figure out that the White Rose is Neil McDonough's daughter. Chun Li knocks Neil McDonough off the roof of the fireball, breaks his neck, buries her dad, plants some sequel bait credits roll. Such a load of crap. Did you even notice the two main characters that I cut from the plot? These two? The Interpol agent and the Thai detective? Nope. Guess we didn't need them. Let's start with the whole abandoning your past life storyline. The first major flaw in this is that no one tries to stop her. Her mother just died, she's clearly in a deeply vulnerable place in her life, and not one of these people, friends, or extended family tries to intervene when she quits her job and packs up her house. And that brings up another issue. She doesn't actually abandon everything like Gen asked her to. She doesn't get up and walk away from it all, taking only some bare essentials and living with the poorest of society. Oh, sure, she sleeps in an alley and skips out on showering for a few days, but at the end of the movie, she's moving right back into her multi-million dollar Hong Kong mansion. Sure, living on the streets for a couple weeks was probably instructive, but she was basically a poverty tourist. If she ever got tired of living in a slum, there was always a mansion waiting back in Hong Kong. This ties directly into the character arc. Chun-Li doesn't really learn anything or change. At the start of the film, she's a confident, spunky, kind-hearted person. As the film progresses, she dabbles in poverty tourism, kills three men in cold blood without remorse, and returns to her life of wealth as a spunky, kind-hearted, slightly more confident person. Now, that's not an irredeemable problem. Lots of good action movies have main characters who don't learn or change all that much. But it is a problem when your movie opens with the main character pondering how they turned into the person they are. Sometimes I wonder how I got to be the way I am. The writers have explicitly set up a transformation story. I used to be a little girl who wanted to be a piano player, now I'm a cold-hearted killer who murders people for the greater good. 
Or, I used to be a selfish upper-class snob, but I learned the value of hard work, community, and sacrifice. Something. Anything. Any transformation contrast is deeply compromised by the early scene where her father is kidnapped. We're shown that she's been exposed to this criminal world since she was a little girl, and we only spend the briefest time with her as a civilian. Because it's such a tiny part of the opening, her time as a concert pianist looks more like a brief interlude in a life of violence, a hobby rather than a normal world that she's pulled out of. And what little we see of her in that stage of her life is basically the same person we see at the end. The only thing that changes is the number of living parents and felony murders. Next up is the whole thing where Neil McDonough transfers his goodness into a little baby. I have a couple problems with this scene. First and least important is that the intensity and violence of the scene is considerably out of place given the tone and treatment of violence throughout the rest of the film. It's an extremely jarring kick the dog scene that's meant to show the audience just how evil the bad guy is, but I think it becomes less effective because it's too jarring. It's such a sharp break from almost everything else that it pulls you out to a place where it stops being the actions of a character and becomes the decisions of some filmmakers. The only other scene that comes close is where McDonough is using the politician lady as a punching bag. Everything else is sanitized, bloodless, PG-13 fantasy violence. Beyond that is the implications of this scene on the metaphysical world of the film. It's one thing for this myth to exist, for Gen to tell Chun-Li this mystical rumor that he heard, but it's effectively confirmed later in the film that his daughter is, in fact, the vessel holding all of the goodness of his soul. That means that in the world of Street Fighter, good and bad are tangible products that can be transferred from one person to another. The implications on free will and morality are staggering, but most importantly, it does nothing to actually improve the story at all. The entire problem I have with this is that it creates a really inconsistent moral center for the movie. You see, the movie basically turns poverty into a privilege. Rather than Bison growing up to be who he is because of socioeconomic pressures, it's just black magic. He didn't get caught up in gang warfare and drugs and violence and slowly desensitized to the lives of other people. It was just black magic. Instead of making the bad guy evil, it just makes him weird. We still have no idea what he's up to, what he's doing on a day-to-day -day basis, and what his end goal is. He has his co-conspirators murdered, but at the time I honestly thought they were the legitimate board of directors of his company, making the whole ordeal kind of stupid. Well, even if they are criminals, it's still a stupid idea. Gangs don't operate like a chessboard. You don't win just because you killed the king. Not that it matters one way or the other, since we have no idea what they're actually up to. Drugs? Human trafficking? Murder for hire? No clue. There's a plot in here about buying up waterfront property for redevelopment, but they're extorting the city board into making the sale, which makes no sense. Was the board zoning the area as a slum for purely altruistic reasons? It's like the writers couldn't decide if bison should be using black magic, private military, shady business practices, or a Chinatown-style conspiracy. So they tried to squeeze them all in. It's hard to care about any of them since the stakes are so low. The people get kicked out of the slum, then vanish, never to be seen or mentioned again. The big showdown at the end with Interpol, Bison, and Chun-Li doesn't even have anything to do with the whole slum buyout anyway, and the plotline is never resolved. Last point before we wrap up. The changes to the source material actively make the story worse. In her original incarnations, Chun-Li is alternately an undercover cop or an Interpol agent. Changing her from a cop to a concert pianist does nothing to raise the stakes or make the character more relatable. In fact, it makes the story harder to tell because now you have to justify all kinds of crazy crap that's super easy to hand wave if she works for Interpol. Why is she in Thailand? She works for Interpol. Why does she know insane martial arts? She works for Interpol. Why does she have combat training and not freak out the first time someone pulls a gun on her? She works for Interpol. Why does she care about the legal front of a criminal organization buying out riverfront slums? She works for Interpol. The character conflict comes baked in. When she confronts Bison, does she stick with her training and let the courts bring him to justice, or does she extract revenge and kill him herself? When she meets Gen, does she stick with Interpol with its superior resources at the cost of rules and expectations, or become a vigilante and join the Order of the Web? Instead, we're asked to believe that a concert pianist who learned Kung Fu as a kid is going to be willing to throw herself at a well-armed international criminal organization and not wind up as a Jane Doe floating face down in the river. 
So they wanted to legitimize the video game adaptation and they screwed it up royally with a god-awful script. Every single problem with this movie comes back to the script. The characters frequently make decisions based on information they don't have because the script needs to get them somewhere. The villains are a chocolate pudding made of every bad guy trope possible, resulting in an antagonist that's too confusing to take seriously, and entire chunks of the film are flat out useless to the story. As if that wasn't enough, it's also too boring to laugh at. There are some gem moments ripe with camp value, but the tone is too serious for the stupid script, and the script is too stupid for the serious tone. So that's Legend of Chun-Li. Take it or leave it. Next week we go back to the guys who brought us Crank 2 with Gamer. That I've got you, got you, got you, got you under my skin. Uh -oh.